I am at the Windermere Ranch Preserve right now. And I'm gonna go hike here. Let's get to it. This is where cows graze. Alright. This trail is literally right here in my backyard, just walking distance. It's pretty nice, actually. Today I brought my binoculars, my new, my binoculars that I review, previously reviewed. It's the Nikon Mark 5 10 by 42. I'm just gonna be out here looking out for some wildlife. So far, I've seen a lot of black phoebes. Black phoebes like to hang around where there's a source of water. Here in this preserve, this trail, there are some stock ponds where cows, the cows here would usually gather to drink water. Black phoebes also rely on those stock ponds in order to get their water. That's why you see a lot of them here. Just a couple things I want to talk about with binoculars. Again, like I said in my review, the power, the amount of magnification isn't really, there isn't really such thing as the right kind of magnification. It comes down to personal preference. The difference, the main difference between the eight times magnification versus the ten again is that with the eight, you get more field of view through your binoculars versus the ten times magnification because, well, obviously you're zooming in more closely to the object than with the eight power, but then you also get more magnification with the ten. One of the biggest complaints about with birders that birders make about the 10 time magnification and then especially the 12 is that the more magnification you get the more shakiness you see and that is true especially if you have shaky hands or even holding your binoculars up for a pretty long time or your pair seems to be heavy that shakiness does start to become apparent with the larger magnific with the larger magnifications. Whereas with the eight, it seems to be the best balance between having a good amount of magnification, but also have a good steady image. On top of that, you get a much nicer field of view. But then again, it all boils down to personal preference. I suggest that you should find a retailer that offers a wide variety of different binoculars. Ask them if you can try them out. Also, look out for some events that may offer that that like birding, bird watching events, where that you can visit. Where maybe there's an event organizer who has a bunch of binoculars to loan for you to try out, and if they have variety. You can definitely take advantage of that to try out multiple binoculars, find what fits you best, what fits your needs, like what's the right amount of eye relief, whether you need the right eye diopter, or you feel like you can handle a 12 time even a 12 time magnification, or you prefer wide view of view. Anyways, that is really how that's really how I would suggest you do if you're trying to get yourself a pair of your first pair of binoculars is try to figure out what you need. Oh, these guys are the worst. Here in California, we have a massive invasion. These are called these are artichoke thistles and golden star thistles. These plants are invasive from the Mediterranean. They were accidentally brought here by the Spanish who came down here for the gold rush. Their cat they brought cattle over and those cattle 
and along with the hay brought over seeds that sprout these thistles and what happens is these thistles thistles spread like wildfire because they don't have any natural predators or I mean herbivores that that feed on them to control the population and the only way to really control them is for, is by us people trying to uh, pull them out up un, uprooting them down to the roots and then trying to eradicate them as much as possible and you want to do them when they're green because when they dry see those seeds they're like dandelion seeds they fly through the air, they spread to new areas, and then they germinate. And these plants can outcompete na any native plants. I've tried, I have uprooted them before, back when I was in, back at, at Merced, at the Nature Preserve. The thorns can pierce through even most garden gloves, like even, even some heavy duty, even work gloves. Like for me, it felt like the only way to uproot them is to either find the pair of gloves that set that is specifically designed to handle even thistles, like like the one pair that I found on Duluth Trading. I haven't bought them yet. I need to buy them, try them out. And hey, maybe I'll even do a review on it. Or I have to get a full metal gauntlet. Nah, I'm just joking about the second one. <laughs> you, it look weird me picking. We with gauntlets, yeah, that would look weird. But yeah, that's our that's a current threat. That's a threat right now. So, anyways, now back to my binoc the binoculars. I still like my Mark Five. The ten by four, the ten time magnification did help me in a few situations. Like, a bird was kind of far away from me, much further than an 8 time magnification can catch. With this, I was able to see it a little bit better. But of course, taking a few steps closer would have made it, would have been the same thing. And then again, you also have to keep in mind, many of the people, the birders in particular, who carry 8x42 generally are also carrying a spotting scope so they already have the zoom in capabilities with a spotting scope pair that was in the wide field view of the 8 power 8 mag time magnification binocular so I do plan on getting that kind of set in the future just not now now in terms of now the way I use my binoculars is the way that my mentor taught me. Before, what I would do is I would just ha constantly hold my binocular, just pan around. What happens is that as I keep doing that, I keep I keep tiring up my eyes because when I'm scanning, even if I was trying to scan as slow as I, it's not too fast. The problem is that. My eyes are constantly being bombarded by light because what binoculars do is it get, basically gathers light through these objective lens straight through the eye, the exit pupil and basically my eyes are constantly being bombarded supposed to keep in one place. What my mentor taught me was don't constantly don't keep the binoculars on your head to look for an a species you're trying to identify start by looking around with your own eyes try to scan the horizon try to see you spy with like up there then lock on that lock onto your subject and lift your binoculars without moving your eyes or your head just like this when you do this it lets you stay locked close to locking onto your subject and all you do is just maybe move a little bit just to adjust and that's it and if you miss target just put your binoculars down and keep on going keep looking so basically use your own eyes first 
before you zoom in. That's actually a great tip. And I do su highly suggest you all try that too. Don't just have your binoculars on your eyes all the time and trying to pan around. It's going to make you dizzy. Rather, just look with your eyes. Oh, see? Look at that. Look at that. It's a Savannah Blue Jay. Wow. Oh, I'm sorry. No, not a Savannah Blue Jay. It's a Phoebe. Oh, it's a Phoebe. Hello. See? See, even without binoculars, I can still see movement. I couldn't identify the bird at first. But all I have to do is, is watch for where that movement was. Lock onto that. And then focus on the Phoebe. Speaking of which, let's see if I can get a film of it for you. Let me first see. Yes, it's standing on top of that nasty thistle. Uh, it's like a, it's like its own throne or something. Now what I'm doing is kind of like digiscoping. Yeah, it's kind of hard to do it free-handed. So it's actually staying at top. Ooh, that sound is made by a metal lark. I don't see it, but I know it's here. The Phoebe is standing right there on top of the thistles. Don't think you can see it because it is kind of far, but yeah, it's right there. That's, now that is where a spy scope would come in handy. You can see birds from further away, and you can also film them, like the way I was doing. See if we can get a little closer. It seems like it hasn't flown away yet. Uh, let's see. I really want to try get a good film, good picture. Oh, there you go. See, it's a Phoebe right there. The one that I spotted earlier. You see? All you do is look out for them with your eyes first, and be patient, because I, because yes. I just, yes, sometimes you get that rush where you want to see animal quickly, but it's always best to be patient with the animal and wait until they rest, then you can try to spot them. Really fun. I like this a lot. Yes. Oh wow, this is really close. Let's see if I can get a better film of this. Wow, got close to this. Uh oh, I don't think it's focusing on it. Oops. Let's see if I can focus it more. There you go. Let's see. This is the fun part about this. You can actually, it's lining up my phone with my binoculars to actually p record, document what I see. As opposed to saying, oh, I saw this bird. I saw this animal, I saw that. Now this place, it, yeah, you probably noticed. <laughs> this place is where cattle graze. They're beef cattle. If you're wondering why cattle grazing in nature is, Air reserve. Well, the reason mainly is because, again, my story I told you about the Spaniards bringing cows, which actually introduced invasive plants like the thistles. Well, it also brought in another invasive speed pest the grass. Yes, I, believe it or not, the grass, the, most of the green grass you see are not native grass, they're invasive grass like medusas, um, Sp Spanish blue grass, uh, fillery, a lot of the gra those grasses are not, the grasses you see are not native, they're also invasive. And ironically, the very species that was brought that introduced everything that's not native is now basically the only hope of controlling these 
from not only spreading, but from also outcompeting all the native plants. So these cows are basically helping by controlling the invasive grass to do grazing. So, even, so they are. So even though they're not native, they are key. They're vital to maintain balancing the ecosystem in the nature. Back to the Vernal Pool Reserve at Merced, the school would lease out the land to ranchers to, to let their dairy cows to graze on the grass. That is to control the grass from overtaking the vernal pools to, allow, to not only allow the pools to keep their waters longer, but also allow the native plants living in the pools to have no competition on the invasive grass, those invasive grass can actually absorb more water more quickly than the native plants and they also germinate faster after rain. So the cows are very important to maintain, to keeping the vernal pools like, oops, don't worry, they're just a flock of morning doves. Oh, fun fact, they're not called morning like good morning, it's the other kind of morning. I'll let you figure out what that one is. But yes, that is why we have, that's how vital cows are for conservation. As you can see, this asphalt trail kind of seems to look like it ends here, but as you can see here, got another dirt trail. This is where having hiking shoe, good hiking shoes comes in handy. Let's go trekking. Right now in Ceremon, it does get, it's summer, so it gets really hot. Like on average, I see the temperature ranging between 98 to 107. Yes, 107, and it could get hotter. So it gets really hot here. So right now I am wearing a jacket because it's early morning, but as the day goes by, it will start to get hotter. So I will take it off, have to take it off. And hopefully, I, I and hopefully, I have enough water to last me throughout this whole hiking trip before I have to head home. <laughs> yeah. And, wow, this place looks really nice. <laughs> yeah, the sun is pretty glaring. I can tell the screen. Hopefully it doesn't bother you guys. Here, maybe if I face it this way, hopefully that helps a little. I'm trying to look out for um, birds of prey, like red-tailed hawks. I sometimes see a red-tailed hawk perched on one of those fences where it would have like a ground, no, I'm sorry, either a ground squirrel or a jackrabbit. And it would just eat that on the fence. It makes sense to eat on the fence because it keeps them from, it helps them avoid competition from coyotes. Now this these hills are can get really steep. This is why you would need to have hiking boots or shoes. Because you know to traverse this uneven steep hill, you know your normal running shoes are not gonna cut it, I'm sorry. <laughs> you either need to have you need to have shoes that are specially built designed for outdoor ter rough terrain. So trail running shoes, hiking shoes, hiking boots, they are basically ideal for this kind of terrain. Now which one should I go? Should I go to the steep hill or go to that flat part? I'm gonna challenge myself. Let's go to the steep hill. Whoo! Time to reach to the top. And in case you're wondering, yes, these bikers are starting to wear me down. Actually, the way I'm wearing this right now is I'm wearing this behind my hoodie. See? It actually makes it more comfortable to carry as opposed to it's directly on my neck. Because, yes, I do admit these bikers are quite heavy. They are worth keeping the weight though, because it lets me see animals right away. That way I don't have to constantly put it back in the case and take it back out, like I explained in my review. 
you know, that case is just really, I don't really, <laughs> I don't use that case for anything else besides storage. I'm not, I can't wear that in my belt. It's just ridiculous. It's honestly kind of silly. Whew. We're halfway to the top. We're only halfway. And hey, once we get to the top, I'll show you exactly what I, ha what I carry on me.